Good evening everyone. Uh, today's conference is included into the uh, Costruire, Abitare, Pensare uh, cultural program from Cersaie. Well, this is a special edition that we uh, you know, wanted to have, uh, even if the pandemic is still going on. So we want to offer people who usually you know, came to Cersaie, especially designers, you will be given to listen to the evolution of projects of very important international architects. Now, our program Costruire, Abitare, Pensare was created inside the Chersai, I mean, an exhibition uh, dedicated to trade. But we can state with pride the culture and especially the project culture. This is included into the world that turns all around the Italian ceramics industry. Now, we have invited hundreds of speakers belonging to the world of architecture and design hundreds of uh, designers and architects. I may mention Renzo Piano, Norman Foster, Eduardo Soto de Mora, uh, but to name some. It is now possible in these meetings to uh, talk about new ideas, to restart from scratch and look for new solutions. This is what we usually find in the conferences of our uh, conference cycle, including in the words pronounced by speakers that we have invited every year to our conferences. We think that this is the very foundation. So all of these elements can be recognized in the ways we have used to manage our companies. These elements gave us the possibility to keep pace and maybe we're just a little step forward as compared to our competitors. So um, I represent Confindustria Ceramica, but also the entrepreneurs of this industry. Uh, I'd like to welcome you here, especially speakers we have today, Alfonso Femia, Rudy Ricciotti and Marco Eroldi. So they will be um, sharing uh, their thoughts with us and they will also be talking about their projects. Uh, I'd like to thank them uh, right away. Thank you for accepting our invitation uh, to take part in this important event. This was made possible by the cooperation uh, and collaboration uh, by the um, uh, International Cooperation Branch of the uh, Italian Foreign Office plus ICE. Once again, thank you so much for being here today. The floor goes now to speakers. Mr. Gambini, thank you so much. Just some technical um, information for the audience. If you want to take advantage of the uh, professional credits uh, as per our uh, invitation email, you have to use uh, the GoToWebinar platform because Zoom doesn't allow you to get uh, credits. Uh, the meeting will be recorded. It will also be, uh, let's say, uploaded into the web channels and the social channels of Chersaie. If you want to ask questions to our speakers, please uh, um, use Zoom. There's a specific box. The section is called the DNR in Italian, so Q&A. And once again, in the GoToWebinar, on the bottom bar, uh, the uh, function is named Domande, so questions. So I'd like to thank ProViaggi Architectura. Thank you so much for your cooperation. Uh, this wouldn't have been possible without you. Thank you so much for the credits and the work you've done at the uh, National Council. And uh, okay, then we can now get into the thick of the conference. I know there's a sort of a fill rouge. Well, actually, it's a, it's not rouge. It's blue. It's a sort of a, a some common elements uh, um, that we can find in the three speakers, uh, uh, you know, today. So it is blue because we have blue like the Mediterranean. So Algeria, France, Genoa, but also northern Italy, Trentino, and then down to southern France. We can now see which kind of projects uh, our guests want to share with you um, tonight. Thank you. Okay, I can start and I uh, think, yes, uh, I have just switched on my mic. Now, first and foremost, uh, um, it's a pleasure for me to be here today with you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for this Italian invitation. So this is uh, the country of my roots. It's a pleasure to uh, speak to you. So Alfonso, uh, well, a long time friend whom I met uh, once again a long time ago. And then Marco Arioldi. 
Now, Mark is always, well, very close to me and uh, he uh, also, uh, you know, uh, takes part in this debate and I will give the floor to him in a few minutes. Now, um, a conference uh, today means that we have to find a specific interest. So what is the key focus, the key interest today? We have to uh, show the uh, difficult the situation, which is what exists as of today. Now I have plenty of uh, pictures uh, that I will, uh, you know, run. Uh, th there's one image every four seconds, and this shows the incredible diversity of my projects and proposals of the uh, well, last twenty years. I can give you some details, but you know this is not the main object of uh, today's conference. I think that the object of today's conference is to show that every single project is based on a constructive uh, narration. So something that is not imagination, it's something very tangible. So when you build something, when you build a building or a site, uh, this is sort of speaking to us. We are in a specific context. I think uh, we went through some difficult years, for example, the 1990s and the year 2000, together with incredibly magnificent years. I mean, we've been attacked by imperialism. Now, the Anglo-Saxon imperialism, I mean. With, you know, a specific kind of mythology. So, in the Latin part of the world, that this was basically not existing. And uh, I've always been against uh, these, you know, uh, Anglo-Saxon influences. I do have some friends, of course, I do appreciate what they do, but I think that there's another generation of architects. Uh, so they, uh, maybe they accept, uh, you know, a sort of a, a cultural deformation, a political message, a universal, political, irreversible message something that you cannot complain against. So this is the first element I'd like to draw your attention on. And then there's also another idea. So we would like to totally capsize, I mean, to change the rules of the, uh, the way we uh, use products today. So a modern consumption style. So maybe we can reinvent our profession. So once again, invention and reinvention. A new narrative a future made of poetry, a new future, also based on technic, uh, technical transcendence, but also technical transgression, if you will. So this is the reason why we are asking questions. Um, it's very difficult to answer those questions, and this may be interesting for those who are listening to us today. You know, this uh, profession is not easy at all. I mean, it uh, creates, uh, you know, anxiety. I think that our profession is so difficult. You know, um, my job, in my opinion, is a sort of a seamless war, a seamless battle. Well, maybe I am paranoid, you may think, but, but this is something you can see in these buildings. For example, this is some metal and concrete buildings. So this kind of paranoia or paranoid idea, I think this is, you know, a sort of a substance. This substance is necessary to create projects like this. So how can we survive from the intellectual point of view when we create a project? You know, this is the MUCE, a museum in Marseille, in southern France. So you have the metaphysical horizon of the Mediterranean. Now, Montesquieu in France said that uh, um, maybe we, uh, we become ridiculous um, if we really, really want to look for exception. You know, um, the Mediterranean uh, Sea is a sort of a tear that never heals. I have designed this project almost 18 years ago. And, uh, and I did that, I mean, based on what I have just said. And uh, I thought I would, you know, fall into something ridiculous. I mean, it was an international contest and I was the local architect. So I, you know, came from this very uh, city and, uh, you know, the uh, terminology used was um, based on xenophobia, 
So I'm not an international architect, I am a local architect, I, I have no international ambition. We also have to remember that our you know, uh, colleagues and the people we work with, so they think that uh, you really have to have this kind of international paranoia, so you have to become international or internationally known. Uh, but, you know, um, I don't travel, I don't have this kind of paranoia. I mean, this is the way I, I want to work and I'm fine like this. So I have the privilege, I mean, to have some architects, you know, close to me uh, who are very faithful and loyal. Uh, Marco Airoldi, uh, Marco will be talking about this in a few minutes because Marco is working with me. And, uh, you know, I know he uh, wears a helmet on his head. And then, you know, he uh, heads right, you know, straight towards the target. And in some cases, I mean, he replaces me when, you know, um, offering uh, educational courses. You know, this is the privilege we have when we are, you know, uh, when we become a little, you know, elderly, uh, we can be helped by young architects. This is one of the first projects, um, thanks to which I understood I was a manierist architect. Now, manierist is a very complex word, uh, difficult to understand uh, unless you read the literature and especially, you know, the 19th century literature. I'm really thinking here of some masterpieces of French uh, literature of the 19th century. Um, so that was more or less the end of the 19th century and, um, you know, intellectuals um, said they belonged to a complex language, which was the language they used. And they were, you know, chanting the archaisms of modernity. So this is what, again, was what was happening at the end of the 19th century. It was a sort, I mean, they thought it was the end of the world and... Uh, We were in the 1890s, so modernity was um, accelerating its pace. It was an incredible, you know, situation, an incredible era for the world. Um, we know that the beginning of decadence starts from the Renaissance. Uh, this is crazy. I mean, the Renaissance is the end of decadence, and that was the end of the religious decadence. You know, there are perspectives concerning the Middle Ages, but also aesthetic decadence, uh, because they also mentioned this aesthetic decadence. Now, this is not a question for us, I mean, for architects, because two centuries later, we, uh, we had to, you know, answer other questions. So we are at the end of the myths. We are at the beginning of the 20th century. And um, this is when we uh, start seeing suffering. So uh, people are suffering in terms of trying to understand the world. So we are forced to see that there's, the, there's an end to the link that links us to modernity. Modernity, unlike what moderns say, um, is a project that's been finished. It's closed. Uh, it is a sort of a, a, a breakage, an interruption, a discontinuation that starts at the end of the 19th century or at the beginning of the 20th century with the liberty style and then uh, basically uh, it finishes or it stops in the 1950s or 1960s. So modernity is over. So this kind of rupture, this kind of breakage generated by modernity, well, you know, this idea uh, needs some specific survival conditions. So once again, we can take into account the rupture, so the breakage of modernity itself. I think that this is a sort of a minimum threshold, okay? So we can do less, but at the same time, we can get plenty of meaning from this less. And then thanks to time, so over the years, uh, and, uh, you know, with our experience, uh, with our expertise, uh, I mean, you know, with time, you know, passing by. And by the way, this is the key message from contemporary architecture. I mean, this is not necessarily a credible aspect. You know, the question may be, for example, um, so what I see, is this the real reality? I remember when I was a child, I was very young and... Uh, I remember I, um, I took some uh, courses in mathematics. My teacher was an accountant. And uh, 
he said to me, I, I remember it was very early in the morning, it was uh, half past six in the morning. So just imagine, you know, the kitchen of a very modest house, uh, so early in the morning, you know, uh, there was a small refrigerator, a very noisy refrigerator, by the way. And uh, maybe we are uh, used to drink something chemical. And um, I mean, that, that teacher was very special, very unique. Uh, I mean, I remember there were flies in the kitchen. Anyway, he tells me, um, so once again, I was, uh, you know, taught uh, maths. And he told me, geometry is the art of reasoning on a false figures. I was 13, so just imagine, um, I mean, I heard the refrigerator vibrating, and then I heard, I mean, this sentence. And, uh, you know, I just woke up. So uh, there was such a heavy effect on me. Geometry, once again, is uh, a reasoning uh, on false figures, the right reasoning on false figures. At that time, I felt, you know, an aesthetic a feeling, a sort of an Italian futuristic feeling. And I said to myself that day, well, what I see is not real. What I see is not the real reality. That is not reality. So I had to look for reality somewhere else. Um, I may not feel any feeling, but I did feel something. So I wanted to define this meaning. I wanted to look for a new meaning. And uh, I decided to start working with our companies, organizations, entrepreneurs, uh, uh, the building companies, construction companies. Uh, um, you know, in Italian, the word uh, uh, you know, uh, builders or developers is uh, so beautiful. The word is muratori, and it comes from a muro, so wall. So the wall makers, if you will. Um, I stared at uh, you know, uh, workers, and it was nice. It was so interesting for, for me. I mean, uh, uh, I, I went to the um, School of Architecture in Switzerland, but, you know, my teachers, uh, I mean, had no architectural culture, in my opinion. So just imagine all of the, uh, you know, disasters of the 1970s. Well, maybe things uh, haven't changed a lot. Anyway, just imagine the context at that time. So I learned to look at this job in a different way, with a different look from a different perspective. So I'm now building something physical. I'm now working on the narrative. So I tried to tell um, about, you know, this, this historical period. I remember that at that time, I did a sort of um, call to memories. So I really wanted to uh, remind or let's say to go back, to retrieve my memories, using it in a very concrete, physical way. So uh, this also has to do with the political, uh, you know, uh, messages. For example, uh, when I had to create a memorial. Anyway, this being said, and because I'm talking about, you know, the workers uh, belonging to a building company or a construction company, well, I owe everything to these people. Now, first of all, I learned to talk to entrepreneurs, uh, and, uh, you know, the construction companies or developers, um, the magic word is please. You know, uh, developers, uh, architects uh, are responsible for the entire project. But at the same time, we need to be able to, um, you know, to play together, uh, just like an accordion, okay? Because we all have to live in harmony when we work. We, we really have to know our profession and uh, this means that, you know, our job is just like an orchestra. So all of this has to be orchestrated, you know, horizontally uh, all together. So we have to mix and match all of these uh, subject matters and disciplines. They have to be, um, you know, uh, sort of uh, incorporated. And uh, um, I think that people build with us, not for us. So everyone has the pleasure to, you know, to build something. So this is something we need to remember. Uh, sometimes we forget about the pleasure of building. So we have to make sure that our partners, uh, you know, in the developers company or architects, uh, we really, really have to remember that this is something you don't learn in a school for architecture. Okay, so once again, the magic word is please. When you ask a company to build, you have to say please, right? Because um, 
it's not difficult to say please okay and um, uh, and of course if you say please uh, you also need to say another word thank you well if please and thank you don't work well maybe you know you have to knee down uh, you know just like when you go to church and uh, by bowing like this you really have to you know to really pray uh, you know the uh, developers or the workers to build something you really have to to say please please uh, sometimes you really you really have to say this I mean to the developer or to the building company if it doesn't work you have to say once again please or thank you please and thank you I mean some companies are really really uh, well robust and they don't accept what you ask so in this case you don't have to knee down and um, maybe uh, you can uh, uh, just ask the developers uh, you know uh, so once again you really really have to ask again you have to beg you really have to beg you really have to say please uh, it would be a pity not to do this please thank you thank you and please if it doesn't work you really really have to uh well strike or shoot the victim so to say anyway so it's a difficult job it's a difficult profession but it is not impossible and you know the message we need to convey to our brothers and sisters is that uh, there's a future there will be a future the future will exist forever the time is not over um, this is not possible okay the time is never over uh, I know it sounds or looks like a simple concept but I think we always have the possibility you know to seize the moment we need to really understand this kind of existential layer or thickness that gives us the possibility to believe um, the name I use for this feeling is thickness just like a veil just like a layer and uh, this means that you really really have some virtues in your profession in your job this is a fundamental aspect you don't have to look for this uh, you know somewhere else I think that um, this uh, you know represents a salary I know but I'm talking about an emotional an intellectual salary there are many advantages in our profession for example emotions once again I'm always surprised to see what companies or developers in this case can do. I think that, you know, this is one of the aspects that I keep um, looking at. And, um, you know, it's incredible that this, this fa fact, I mean, uh, the architectural, you know, new roses, if you will. So the fact of doing and undoing. Look at this project. I think that this is what I mean. So you have the impression you can climb all the way up. so uh this building seems like there's skin around it uh, covered with skin or upholstered so what is fundamental for us is we need to understand the tail so why am i talking about a tail why am i considering a story so what is a tail for well i think it gives us the opportunity to look for the right energy we can find the right energy so we can't ask architects i mean to let us dream uh, there are so many rules and regulations and standards we have to comply with but i mean dreaming is free of charge uh, i just uh, i'm just asking people to dream of a better future i mean I, i'm not asking you to be politicians or you know um philosophers sometimes architecture is politics we uh, don't have to be you know economists even if i know economy just uh, you know guides our own responsibility and i know that architects do have this kind of important responsibility once again they have to comply with budgets you know customers have huge colossal responsibilities i know so once again i'm not asking you to uh, get rid 
of responsibility. Um, no, we, we need to stay in touch with responsibilities. Responsibilities are our own responsibilities. You know, reality um, slips away. It moves away. Sometimes reality uh, is a trap. Now, um, these are um, so many projects uh, that may be commented in many different ways. For example, this is the Dijon uh, Academy. Uh, look at this building. Uh, this is the Academy and um, there's a specific kind of shapes, you know, rounded shapes uh, looking like uh, mummies. So uh, it is uh, as if we were inside. There's a very special circulation and movement inside. There's a round staircase. And this may be a, an excuse or a pretext. I don't think we can give up. And, uh, you know, look at this project. I mean, this is very budget. I mean, cheap with small windows, as you can see here. You know, sometimes uh, it doesn't take much. Um, you just need, you know, just a little um, thing to uh, share a tale. And look at the graphics here. Uh, in this case, the reference is to the uh, graphics of the 1930s. Now, many uh, of the projects uh, that we have made are cultural projects. So we have, you know, um, showrooms, uh, museums, auditorium. Um, I also understand and I also realize that um, here there's no residential uh, buildings in the slides I'm sharing with you. Every single project is uh, an adventure. So it is an adventure with uh, many risks. And, uh, you know, our responsibility consists in the fact of having everything under control. So we need to uh, make sure we can control our job. So once again, we are maybe taking risks, but of course uh, we don't have to have risks of danger for the carpenters, for the uh, developer, for the workers, for the uh, smith. I mean, the people working. And this is a key message, a message I really would like to convey to all of you because, you know, we have to be able to manage uh, all of the interfaces of this profession. We need to master, to manage them. So we need to make sure there's an encounter of disciplines, of jobs. If we are not able to do so, we will just disappear. Architects are fighters, warriors, as I said before. Um, so in this case, uh, I'm sure I'm sharing with you a, a project with white concrete. Here you have, uh, let's say, a social housing project. So uh, I try to give some joy to, uh, you know, these um, social housing projects. So here you can see the memorial of Italian, you know, uh, parachutists. And um, I feel very, very close to this kind of project. And uh, I'm really very close. I'm very attached, if you will, to uh, all of our soldiers that uh, um, offer a sort of a democratic or even republican heritage so they keep fighting for us so you have a french soldiers italian soldiers or u.s soldiers this is the media tech and uh, the neighborhood here is absolutely horrible so the landscape is absolutely eerie uh, thanks to this cube the local landscape has been reinvented um, it looks like a fountain. I mean, it is an urban landscape, which is absolutely ugly and, uh, well, let's say unfortunate, as I, as I like to say. Um, this system uh, has been protected. Uh, once again, uh, there are plenty of difficulties in this neighborhood and uh, it requires uh, um, protection. It is a, a violent uh, uh, neighborhood. So this kind of cube is sort of uh, magical. 
Uh, can you see these layers or these kind of breaks or ruptures on the facade? This is something we've been able to do to give light inside. Here we have uh, uh, renovated this very special building. We have uh, used uh, different materials, we've used uh, uh, concrete. Uh, so what is really very interesting is the columns uh, uh, right at the center and in general inside. Um, the original building uh, was, uh, I mean, uh, made at the beginning of the 19th century with plenty of columns. So we had the opportunity to use some white color, some chalk, and um, there's basically no continuity with the previous building. Uh, anyway, in this case, we have worked, uh, you know, on the uh, uh, ground, but also on the top. We have added columns. Uh, we try to... Uh, uh, let's say make it lighter. It is a seismic area. We have used uh, columns which are almost elastic, I mean flexible, with no damages in case of earthquake. This is what we have done. We have multiplied, I mean, the number of these pillars. Uh, this is what we usually do, I uh, know, in the, uh, well, uh, plantations, uh, because, you know, this area may be flooded. So water here can uh, rise and almost touching the bottom of the uh, bridge. So uh, we have created uh, technical systems. We also wanted to make sure we had hydraulic transparency. It was an excellent project in my opinion. In this case, I've, I've also cooperated with my, with my son and I said, don't start the architecture, you can just help me, uh, well, without a formal, uh, let's say, support. As you can see here, we work more and more often with uh, plates. Uh, not in the mechanical sense of the mini, but uh, a sort of an imagination. You can imagine that there are plates. This is a bound uh, system. Uh, there's an incredible work made of horizontal plates. All of these plates are made in concrete. There's plenty of thin concrete. Uh, these are fins. Uh, it's a technology we've been using for quite a long time. And in our agency, we've been the forerunners, I mean, the uh, uh, pioneers. We have used the uh, concrete made the horizontal thin uh, bars. Uh, once again, uh, this is uh, concrete. Um, we don't have much porosity because this material is very dense, it's very thick. So we have the possibility to offer plenty of, uh, let's say, uh, sturdiness, but at the same time, plenty of lightness. This is the reason why I really like concrete. I mean, people don't like it, I do. I think that concrete uh, has some, let's say, uh, environmental, uh, you know, footprint which is favorable which is positive i think we need to believe in concrete and we have to uh, re uh, ignite some energy into concrete today um, i like knowledge as an idea and wisdom so thanks uh, to the uh, well concrete uh, um, uh, making companies we are now able to have this beautiful matter available uh, concrete is very important and very green because, I mean, the uh, supply chain, but also the, uh, uh, let's say, uh, production chain is very short. Now, as for some current projects, uh, uh, it's a pleasure for me to keep working with concrete. In this case, we use less and less, uh, um, well, we emit into the atmosphere less and less CO2. Now, look at the um, effects of these uh, three different uh, levels. So, um, if you will, there's a lack of definition between the different floors. Um, you may think that they are not horizontal, of course they are. So, there are deformation of the plates, as I said before, and some uh, slabs, large side slabs. Um, look at what, I mean, the workers of this developer uh, have done. There's an incredible ingenuity. Uh, in this case, we are using, you know, specific, um, you know, uh, boxes. I like another word in Italian, cassa forma, which is, you know, this kind of big boxes, wooden boxes that we use uh, to, to, to uh, um, build homes. Now, this was a warehouse. Uh, they kept tanks here. Now it is a music um, arena. Uh, there's um, 
shelter, but the area is basically an open air uh, concert area. This is a project and it's still a dream, so the project uh, didn't come true in this case. Uh, there's a sort of an um, sanctuary here. Now, the uh, contest was very interesting. And uh, inside this complex, uh, you know, underground infrastructure, um, you know, I really liked it. Anyway, the winning project was made in words. So maybe, you know, in France, we fear our own roots, but roots are reversible. So... Um, Maybe the managers of this contest didn't really like um, concrete and they preferred uh, wood. So here we are in uh, Corrida and uh, we have used uh, so many petals of roses. Uh, well, that was something so special. You can see here the paseo, which is, I mean, the uh, sort of, uh, you know, presentation, the show uh, before the real fight and this was the so-called inauguration i mean uh, the uh, building uh, was um, you know taken over by a new um, you know manager here we are in the city of bordeaux with 12000 uh, seats and i remember here that the technology we have used that was very special um, an incredible effort has been made here with the uh, specific uh, you know, wooden boxes and wooden structure containing uh, wood. This was an exceptional masterpiece uh, with, you know, all of the technical equipment to be installed and then, you know, melting concrete inside. Uh, now, all of this has been done, as you can see here, um, this is bright white concrete at the very last floor so in the attic there are so many perforations and so that air and light can go through so in this case we move in the north of france and in some cases we do some restructuring and renovation works so in this case we have basically renovated a covent built in the 18th century now it's a contemporary art place uh, this is a re the so-called the regional fund for contemporary art and uh, well this is the money we have used I mean to renovate this building so these objects or these buildings that represent a marvelous asset so we keep traveling around France so look at the columns now all of the columns show a variable geometry look at the different uh, faces the faces uh, the uh, silhouettes and the profiles because uh, uh, it is with this that we have played so once again look at this uh, basically this is uh, a box containing art it's a container of art all of these pieces are basically uh, well the vertical pieces with different faces and um, you know once again this is the uh, inside you see here massive pieces so look at the carpentry works here uh, all of these bars are made in metal all of this has been done to uh well let's say fight against you know the earthquake because this is an uh, a, you know a, a seismic region uh here we are in Aix, so this is a city in provence so in southern france uh, all of this is uh, uh, made in concrete and it is basically, um, well, a theater or a show arena. In my opinion, this is really, really, uh, let's say, accepting modernity. As you can see here, it looks like the skin of an elephant. You also need to have the right suppliers, I mean, the right, you know, uh, companies that they can work with you look at you know the uh, roughness on the surface and all of the uh, curved uh, rounded shapes and by the way you can see this building from the motorway uh, here we have a uh, skyscraper now this was the first skyscraper made in la defense in paris in 1976 as you can see here, all of those plates, they were very, uh, well, very dark. So these plates were either gray or black. And uh, uh, we have worked a lot to renovate that project. 
This is an office building, so a long horizontal building. Now, gin is not an American invention. I think it comes from my country, from France. Uh, I'm talking about the jeans, as we say, so denim, right? This is a TGV uh, high-speed train station in the city of Nantes. Now works have been completed with wonderful columns. So we have worked a lot on the columns, on the irregular you know, um, surface and shape of the columns. Now this is basically a big bridge. This is the station. So uh, in this case, I have worked with incredible companies. I mean, um, they have been able to uh, create a specific balance for the bridge. We have used uh, a sort of so-called traps. So when I say traps, I mean empty spaces filled with sand. Then we have, you know, raised the, the bridge. I mean, the weight is some thousands of tons. So once again, uh, this is an irregular project. I mean. Uh, in terms of irregular shapes. It is a fantastic, a uh, one-of-a-kind project. Here we have uh, um, an industrial hangar. Uh, this is, I mean, the look is really industrial. We have used uh, a stone that we have used for the main foundations. Um, we want it to be as close as possible to the uh, 19th century typical industrial architecture. This is what I've done with Marco Airoldi, with the forest, as we like to say. Um, this is, uh, you know, one of the projects for which I really wanted to be the architect. I couldn't do without this. So once again, here you can see deformation and fragility at the same time. Uh, I'm almost finished. Okay, you can see here the uh, multiplex uh, cinema in the city of Cannes in southern France. So these are very recent pictures. I mean, the building is still being built. Uh, look at the mesh, so the net on the top. All of this has been done for molds and with molds. It was really incredible how they managed, I mean, to, to, uh, to manage molds in order to have this kind of, you know, uh, deformed uh, um, systems. Just a couple of minutes before closing and giving the floor to Alfonso. Look at the pillars. In this case, we have used the black um, concrete. You can see here the slabs, you know, still protected. And this is the uh, foot bridge that we have uh, created with dark slabs. Uh, you can see here a reference to uh, Enzo because uh, you have the impression here that uh, you have used, you know, a paintbrush on fresh concrete. So you may think that uh, all of these areas have just been painted, but of course uh, uh, they are not. This is a project for Louisiana, so it is a sort of a long pathway. Uh, it's a connection to a school, so uh, I have temporarily, you know, set aside that project. This is another project, uh, and um, here I had made uh, the so-called Maison du Peuple. We have used plenty of technical walls uh, made with uh, glass. The project has worked very well. This is another project. It's a contest for Morocco. So here we have worked with industrial engineers. We have also worked with uh, suppliers of rock. And this rock is almost transparent. This is a very recent project. Uh, we have we are in, here in Nozi B. This is a resort in Madagascar. Well, I thought um, I would find something very archaic there, but the situation was much more modern than I thought. In this case, uh, they have used uh, a wood, so wood also for the uh, a scaffolding. This is a sort of an archaic architecture. This is something that belongs. To the local population, this is a common uh, language that you can see in the in the island. Uh, well, people there are still uh, building in this way. Okay, so no no support and no networks. Look at this construction. Uh, you may think it's a sort of a it's a hill. Uh, they are basically hidden in the very thick 
uh, you know, forest. It's really impressive. The idea is so archaic. So this is a beautiful archaic idea that I just wanted to rediscover and share with you. This is it with my uh, slide. Okay, so we are now flying back home. Thank you so much. Okay, then, thank you once again. And uh, I think I can now give the floor to Alfonso. Uh, or maybe Elena, do you want to, okay, to tell us how to manage the conference now. Mr. Uh, Ricciardi, we have received a couple of questions. So the first one is from Alessandra Padovani and Alessandra says, uh, Mr. Ricciardi, thank you so much. A beautiful presentation. Um, uh, what about the Mediterranean light? Uh, is it one of your friends or one of your accomplices, accomplices of your projects uh, or is the Mediterranean light a dangerous enemy? Parliamo della, fondamentalmente della mitologia mediterranea. Mitologia perché, uh, mythology because it can be, you know, an enemy or a friend, right? So once again, um, light in terms of, okay, Mediterranean light, okay? It is a sort of hysteria because, um, it can really be defined as uh, hysteria. Uh, in some cases, for example, we have small windows in prisons uh, to see the light coming in. This is the fruit of hysteria. The Mediterranean light, well, this is very fascinating, very charming, but you don't have to trust it all the time. You know, I've always, you know, uh, lived along the, uh, um, you know, coasts of the Mediterranean. When I see tourists, uh, uh, I keep saying, well, you must be crazy. I mean, uh, so you, you can see tourists, you know, climbing on the top of the mountain. They want to embrace nature as if it was, you know, uh, an ideal perfection. So in my opinion, uh, they make a mistake. Well, anyway, back to your question. No, I don't trust the light. Uh, so the Luce Mediterranea, so the Mediterranean light. Um, well, in my opinion, the Mediterranean is a sort of a plot against me. It manipulates me and uh, it changes uh, the way I work. Okay, so hopefully I have answered this, this interesting question. I have a second question before giving the floor to uh, Alfonso. Kevin Lambda says, uh, Mr. Ricciotti, as for the evolution of aesthetics, do you think concrete is still a current, uh, uh, a fashionable, uh, let's say, matter. Recently, I took part in the Trophée Beton, so a contest. I uh, participated, I haven't won. Um, this architectural form is not accepted today, so uh, maybe it means that we are not ready. Okay, it's a sort of a complex question, but I think that... Um, we all fight, if you will, uh, against our reciprocities. If we really, really think we are able to, uh, let's say, create something nice with concrete, well, of course, we can use it. If we uh, believe in words, of course, we can use words. I mean, maybe, uh, you know, uh, we, we keep thinking of, you know, making everything lighter. And this is why people say no to concrete and yes to water. People say that uh, concrete has a major, strong environmental impact. But these people mm, make a mistake. For example, I use, uh, you know, uh, chalk, I mean, gypsum, right? I think, once again, this is an American imperialistic, you know, attitude. I mean, they want us to be a people doing architecture with a very, uh, let's say, thin walls uh, with counter ceilings, uh, I think. You know, uh, I think this is a very risky, um, you know, attitude, and um, I don't think this is a, this is an advantage. I mean, from the environmental point of view, I know very well what's happening in the uh, construction industry in Italy and in France. We all fight, uh, you know, the to have, uh, let's say, less environmental disasters. I mean, we have less and less forests in France, so we are lacking biodiversity. So there's uh, a major work on the uh, reforestation. I was interviewed by the Swiss TV uh, some time ago. People say we need to build in water. And I say, well, listen, you in Switzerland, you have uh, uh, 
let's say, um, such a high importance in the world because of your money. But do you know other areas that maybe we don't want to, to deforest? Maybe other countries want to do exactly the opposite. I mean, we can use our minerals, our woods, without, you know, doing too much, which is what you do in Switzerland. So I'm telling, you know, Swiss people, please protect what you believe in. Mr. Ricciotti, thank you so much. Uh, Alfonso Femia from the Alfonso Femia Atelier. Alfonso, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, then. I think that uh, you have, uh, well, invited me to uh, get into the thick of my presentation. So I'm echoing your words. Okay, then. So after trying to speak French, let me now go back to my mother tongue, Italian. So... This is to make sure you understand my point of view. Okay, we need to stop the uh, translation into French. Okay, so yes, okay, Alfonso, you can speak Italian. I will try and listen to you in Italian. Okay, then, so as you said before, uh, and uh, by the way, today uh, this, we, we have this opportunity, I mean, to meet again. Um, even if virtually. Now, meeting uh, Rudy Ricciotti was so important for me because, uh, well, you know, Rudy, uh, of course, uh, has a great culture, a key focus and respect towards Italy. You know, I studied in Genoa and, uh, you know, when I started working as an architect with other friends in Genoa, so it was and it still is a very uh, difficult, you know, a time for architecture. I'm now talking about 1996, so Rudy had already a major experience, but then he resumed, I mean, his pathway because uh, uh, he was, uh, you know, in a very, uh, well, explorative phase. So he was exploring. I was, uh, you know, um, surprised by what you said. So here in Italy, we were talking about diets, but at the same time, we were sure of some specific building or architectural approaches. If you really take into account what architecture wanted to say, well, uh, I have experienced, I mean, all of these statements. For example, we talked about the importance of the matter, the material, the places. So plenty of, uh, you know, generosity from architecture without stating what uh, it was supposed to do. You talked about wood. And of course, you say, okay, just, uh, you know, uh, do what you believe in, basically, you said. And there's something that uh, I have understood. So after 10 years of dialogue and meetings with Rudy, I understand that what works very well in France, as you say, you know, matière and, you know, métier, so the matter and the job. So these two words are very similar in French, because in a way, they, they talk about an idea that has to do with the history we have. Uh, it is linked to the uh, you know, local story, the small and medium enterprises that we have in our local communities. So if we move away from this, and uh, you know, this is what's happening in the Mediterranean, and again, uh, it also happens in France, and even in Italy, what well, this means we are losing ourselves. And uh, you know, this is what I have imagined, uh, thanks to uh, you know uh, meeting friends like Rudy. Um, I have to say that you know this is the beginning of a dialogue. So we meet uh, a story, we meet a city. So um, I don't need to talk about context. I think that you know it's an encounter. You know when you encounter a person, when you meet a person, you don't know which kind of story you want to tell, right? And this is the reason why, you know, I really uh, believe in uh, statements like uh, okay i am an architect and if you want to try and be an architect as rudy said uh, well this is very important i mean you can try to be an architect i mean uh, you are never sure you can succeed um, you may think that architecture is beauty aesthetics or space i think you know it is a sort of an encounter between imagination on the one side and the real life on the other so as we have seen in Rudy's pictures I mean there's plenty of imagination I mean the way we use to talk about ourselves you know some words for example uh, imagination is what tries to become real 
So uh, it is a very close relationship. It can also be a paranoia, as you said. I mean, the fight or even the encounter between imagination and reality. And um, there's also another image uh, uh, that I have on the back of my mind. I mean, uh, a masterpiece is interesting when it is a stratified. So maybe a fashion, the beauty of a woman or the look. So there's something that really reaches to the very top, if you will. So it's much more than a fashion uh, picture. So this is my personal, you know, logical uh, thinking. And uh, in terms of architecture, I'm always, you know, on the watershed of two different dimensions. So I don't, don't want to surf on the surface of the water, but I like to uh, dive. I mean, um, I also like, you know, the silence uh, when it comes to architecture. But I understand that this is a very special, extraordinary condition within a context that into which we consider the idea of time. So in this context, um, it is very difficult I mean, to have time. So um, in other words, that this means that fragility, uh, which is what we all feel now because of COVID, uh, we have to get close to each other. When you talk about fragility, you can also get in touch with you know, our own um, stories. So uh, th there was, um, a first project that did in France, it was a difficult one because um, it could have been uh, done as a restructuring or renovation of the so-called aesthetic tale in order to restore the building. But I remember this anecdote from a French critic at the beginning of the building site. I, I told uh, about the project and I told about the uh, feelings, I mean, the sentiments. I mean, that place I had to become a destination. It was a sort of a private property, if you will, but it was, a, you know, a public project. So we created a specific pathway with artists, painters, and then um, developers, uh, small and large companies. So we all shared the word desire. And this critic said, well, Italians, you are so romantic with words. But then, of course, I want to see what you, are, what you have done at the end of the building site, so at the end of the construction. Now, I understand, you know, that that was a major challenge. Once again, back to the uh, watershed. This project, Cote Blue, is a long project. We have developed uh, seven types of blues. And um, at the same time, you know, we have worked with some workers from France. We have worked uh, together in order to, uh, you know, lay uh, all of the pieces uh, representing the project. Now, the original idea is so far away from this. Uh, I mean, this is a huge project. And once again, you know, this idea is so far away from the vision of uh, the customer, JP Morgan in that case, uh, but maybe very close to uh, my friend, Mark Petrie, because, uh, I mean, he passed away, but, you know, this is what he wanted. And then again, as you said, we need to be responsible. So this place had to establish a dialogue with the city. It had to be poros. It had to have pores. Um, it is a hero building because it is it is impossible to think to, 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 to have overlays or overlapping. You just can tell a small fragment of a story talking about current desires, talking about the way in which light gets into every single point. Maybe uh, there's uh, a wind there, uh, the Mistral wind, 180 days a year. At the same time, there's another responsibility in this project. Uh, the northern facade, uh, it was not requested. I mean, there was a very simple, you know, security staircase. Well, for us, that became an important point. So we didn't, uh, I mean, we decided not to work with aesthetics or architecture, but we have used words. So that place belongs uh, to uh, the people from Marseille, a city founded by ancient Greeks almost 300 years before Christ. So um, uh, Camus, Casanova, Hemingway, uh, people have written and people have sung about Marseille. And uh, maybe today we, we don't think about identification. So there's a boundary. We have to cross the boundary and the surface has to be porous. So this is what I mean by contamination, integration and belonging. We started from a very intimate scale, then we moved up to territorial scale, so it belongs to the entire city of Marseille. Now, the project, in my opinion, is an act of generosity. 
And as you said, generosity um, is based on listening to the others. We need to uh, listen to developers. Uh, sorry, Alfonso, uh, you, you haven't shared the screen because I think uh, so you haven't seen anything so far. Uh, sorry, yes, we, we thought we were just, you know, speaking uh, without any presentation, but I have shared my screen. Okay, I think you do now. Okay, sorry, we, we thought you were, you know, speaking without any, any specific presentation. Okay, sorry. Okay, I can speed up a little bit just to talk about the images that I have just described. Okay, I don't want to go back to the previous pictures. So, okay, I have just described, I mean, the uh, pathway uh, with the docs project. This is, uh, um, you know, this is a, um, a challenging project. So, in Marseille, they said, well, it's impossible to do this in France because this means that every single element of the facade had to be certified. So it was impossible to work with artisans or small companies. But anyway, we managed to do this because uh, people have been very generous. I mean, generosity means responsibility of the architects so that every single player can work and create the project. In the book, I say that aesthetics is not enough. There's much more than aesthetics. And uh, together with some of my friends, um, we have, I mean, designed a sort of a Mediterranean glossary. And, um, and of course, we ask questions on architecture or around architecture. So this is why generosity is so important for me. Uh, so here we have created um, butterflies. This is a very dense residential uh, building uh, having to do with contemporary architecture. But uh, people forgot that that was a green area, a forest uh, very close to a unique cemetery. So uh, our look, thanks uh, you know, to this uh, uh, you know, ceramic tile cladding, so you have a different perspective uh, overlooking the park, and then you have butterflies. And there's a question here. So why not the butterflies? I mean, why not interacting like this? So this is an element that we started uh, implementing in France. This is the Neuilly sur Seine. Uh, so once again, we start from the uh, typical French language with briquettes, so the small bricks. But then, of course, uh, we didn't want to make any difference between you know social housing projects and non-social housing projects. So we have used the same elements, so everyone belongs to that place. You can see here that the matter creates a relationship with the light, so that you understand that there's a major variability with light. At the same time, you implement something which is not iconic, but once again, uh, there is no difference versus the most important uh, precious buildings. So here we are in Turin, celebrating 150 years after the unity of Italy. So here we have created uh, different types of fish representing the Mediterranean and uh, Italy. So the context here is based on black and red. You can see here a uh, sort of uh, ceramic uh, pebble stones. So we want to represent a dramatic point, but at the same time, we also wanted to state another idea. So we wanted to share a public space. So, and again, without forgetting imagination, which is always so important. So um, when we work on boundaries, well, this is great because, you know, um, so every project, you know, represents a challenge. So the challenge is not possible at the very beginning. Look at this, uh, you know, big element. This is, you know, uh, glass, and it uh, sort of, uh, you know, separates uh, some offices. Oh, this is a university in Milan. We have different towers. Uh, here we have created specific pathways. All of this becomes a sort of a wall towards the city, and um, at the same time, the staircase talks about the contrasting power and proximity between different buildings. 
So these are some of the so-called architectural pathways. Look at this, you know, safety um, staircase. And uh, it becomes a sort of a grammatical system to talk about the building, also to talk about the architectural fragility. As Rudy said before, constraints or limits are very strong, bold elements representing separations. This is a huge auditorium, but it is a living animal. Here we have, uh, you know, cut slabs made of ceramics. This matter becomes very precious. I like this condition, you know, because every single time, thanks to different materials and to, you know, with artisan or craftsmanship, you can turn, uh, you know, a poor basic element into a very important one. This is Dallara, this is another residence. So this approach doesn't only work with some functional categories. This approach can be defined in every single kind of project. So uh, it doesn't just apply to residential buildings and or offices. Now here the project is quite simple. Uh, well, this is a sort of a protruding element towards the city. And, uh, you know, quite often, you know, we don't want the building to become a limit. So uh, we need to have collective spaces and the spaces uh, uh, which are, let's say, called private spaces. At the same time, we have another idea. So uh, these flats don't have a major value in terms of real estate, but here you can see a sort of a gallery so that you can have light inside, you can see the uh, landscape down there outside. And uh, this is something that we didn't have in residential projects. Uh, everything is smaller. I mean, uh, there is no, there's no generosity in the places we live in. Uh, apartments are smaller and smaller, hallways are smaller. Um, this is a, a meeting we had with Ruti, uh, well, uh, four years ago in Pisa in 2017. And then he talks about the motion of the forces and in the shapes of our uh, work. Um, so once again, um, here, we are describing the matter and to do so we also need to talk about perception so how do we look at reality it is always a perception it is much more than a function i really would like to talk about territory we need to feel like territory look at this picture uh, this is genoa but no one knows people think that genoa is a city and you know, on the sea that you can see from the sea well, you can also see Genoa from the back. I mean, um, you know, from the mountains, uh, uh, very close, I mean, to, to the city. You can see here this beautiful, you know, round of waves, uh, natural waves uh, represented by the mountain range uh, very close to Genoa. Look at the light. In this case, we the, the, the title of this exhibition is Meta. This is a white building. And then again, imaginary or imagination. You know, there's a sort of a comparison between imagination, reality, and feeling. Now, feeling means the will, choice, and as Rudy said before, we need to fight against some common places or cliche, for example, local architecture or international architecture. So uh, what is very important for us is to have a starting point, and then you can travel, and then you may want to go back to, your, to the city where you come from. For example, I come from Genoa and I still you know, work for my city. As Leonardo da Vinci said, we need to say that every single one of our ideas is based on our will. This means that we need to understand that we have different types of architectures. So in my opinion, um, architecture has a collective dimension. It is done for the people, it's done for the community. We also have to uh, state a strong idea. I mean, we also have to consider the fragility uh, so that we can really make a comparison with real things. We don't have to be, um, you know, too strong, too bold or rejecting um, comparisons. Once again, this is the Pisa Biennale, once again in, in, in 2017. And uh, so once again, here we talked about being Mediterranean. And this is my key idea, the journey. I have never done it, but in my opinion, the journey is a sort of, again, a, a travel, a journey into imagination. 
This is the uh, Messina Strait in southern Italy with Sicily, which is a separation. Um, this is what we have in the strait. Okay, so we never have the perception that uh, you know the sea there is so deep. There's something extraordinary, and it is a myth. It goes back to mythology. It is not a romantic idea because this is what we have to have today as uh, an approach. The look, the look towards reality. And of course, we need to travel. We need to look all around us. We need to take into account the different contexts. Look at these stratifications, the different levels. We have strengths and weaknesses. We have the fragility um, that we have to come to terms with. So these two villages are very close to each other, but at the same time, they are so far away from each other because um, you know they are separated by a strait. Now, uh, in the light, uh, not as a matter, but as an element able to, to talk. So in the light, I've always found the so-called manierism, as Rudy said before, because um, we always have uh, left a sort of a relationship between light and shadow. In many different ways, uh, we look for light, I mean, for the light. I mean, the light is an element of the context. I mean, the light of Marseille is different from the light of Genoa. So there are peculiar, typical conditions in every single place. So we need to get into the context if we really want architecture to be um, the right opportunity to create real scenes, to talk about our time and our conditions. So uh, we work with light and shadow. And in my opinion, this is a key element. Of course, uh, uh, it takes place with space. It takes place with the matter. I think that, um, you know, we don't have to think that every single building is indifferent in terms of its shape, but it has to create a relationship with its context. We need to create a space-light ratio, ratio, or even relationship with the rest of the uh, of the environment. So this is the reality we are going through today. Uh, Murakami says, if there are shadows, of course, there must be light. So this is very dramatic, if you will, uh, which is our perception. Sometimes the light is a narrative, so we can talk about the light. So we just have to step back a second, change our point of view, and we discover totally different images. Quite often we can say that the light is a body, so the light is really able to interpret or to read things. This is the right element that gives us the possibility to see. Last but not least, the light is history, because, um, of course, uh, um, there's always been a relationship with the light, and this relationship is still told to us today. This is the entrance of the ice palace. So it's totally black, but then you see the totally white. So uh, all of this is not just aesthetics, that this has a relationship with existence and um, you know history. Look at this, uh, you know, uh, glass panels. This means that you can live space in a different way. This is another residential building close to the university. Here we have different colors. Uh, this is an office building. And look at this geometry. So in a way, we can vibrate. We can let the facade vibrate. You get closer and you see different contents. Or you can see something very dramatic. Uh, look at this building because it absorbs the light in many different ways. We want to talk about the light in uh, different ways. And... Uh, so architecture always has to be different depending on when we perceive architecture, depending on our perspectives and depending on the conditions of the local light. This is another building in Milan. So uh, as you can see here, we made the plenty of towers. Um, they all look the same. Our building have, has three different facades three different facades depending on the places we are in. Here we want to give a specific rhythm, I mean a pace to all of our glass windows. And here we have some changes of the type of glass so that there's an ever-changing, you know, um, situation here on the uh, landscape. So we read the building in a different way. 
we also have to have the same scale, the same relationship with the context. So inside and outside, uh, these are two different relationships. You can see here the corner, so the building is lower and it is basically an extruded building. We play with reflections, with uh, rhythm, variable geometry. So you have a different relationship between the base and the height. So once again, we play with transparencies. Every time the building looks different. So there's a key relationship with the sky and uh, it plays, you know, with the plot of the building. And it all happens, you know, uh, right there in the corner. In the night, it reveals its true nature. So the building can really talk about its own life. The context is totally transparent, so international, but the building is autonomous and independent. Look at the reflections inside. Uh, this is like maniac. Look at the light inside. I mean, there's a strong rhythm inside. So in a way, it's, uh, it defines itself. So we work directly with the ceiling with no false ceilings or so-called counter ceilings. So we have, you know, dried the soul of the building. So the matter here is so physical and concrete. This is a different light. This is a project in my hometown, Genoa. What is special here is that the building can really talk about the language of the infrastructure because the building is inside the port area. Um, you know, the staircase are the basis of the building. Well, here they are flying high because, uh, you know, there are stairs on the corner. So the system is very complex. And depending on its perception, it looks like one tower, two towers, three towers, many towers. So the light changes the perception and the tail of the building, as I said before. This is a very specific condition. I mean, building close to the sea, especially in Genoa. At the same time, the building looks for a dialogue with the rest of the context. It can be beautiful, it can be ugly. So this is the industrial context. I mean, the basement uh, is a sort of an infrastructure, and this is what you have all around. You may not like the other elements, but they belong to that place, that context, and the typical story of that city. This is a building in Rome, maybe... Um, you don't know this very architectural facade, but once again, there's plenty of generosity here because here, you know, I usually say that, um, I say, well, what is the least sexy building you can make? Well, it's an office building. It's basically, uh, you know, a sort of a stereotype with no major, uh, what say, opportunities to change the tale or to change the story. Even more so if it is a bank building. So uh, a bank is discreet. Uh, it doesn't want to tell anything. Well, here the building has to speak the language of this place, which is an infrastructure. It is a station. There's a separation. And we have, you know, this huge size of the station so that we can really enjoy this space. You know, the building here changes all the time. This is the sky of Rome, the light of Rome. And you can see here the main, um, well, many relationships, so many behaviors that the building has in the context. I mean, there is no strong relationship with the context. There are no anchoring elements. But then the building is very generous. So this dialogue, you can see that the building is always variable. It has created a big belly inside. Thanks to ceramics, you have the light all the way up to 50 meters up in the sky. It is a suspended condition. And uh, depending on the light, uh, the size is different. The building is very long. And again, uh, the infrastructure offers a specific scene and uh, there are many different relationships based on strengths and weaknesses of this place. We've been able to, uh, you know, identify a strong will. So it has a specific function. At the same time, the building is able to be identified with that place. And uh, there's a major variability having to do with the relationship with the light. It depends on the conditions of the sky. The building becomes dramatic, dark, brighter and uh, you better understand uh, the uh, construction technology okay very quickly last point the last project but this is very important for me there are two souls in every project the place and the man's soul and uh, in this project this is the dallara academy now dallara is um, a global leader in terms of uh, you know engine 
this is a very small village close to Parma and uh, the context is you know so natural all around the building uh, and um, we need to understand how the Lara is so we decided I mean not to put fences all around it it is a public space the landscape gets into the building and again this space is a private one but it is also a public one because there are no fences all around the building so what they do there is basically training education uh, they also make uh, cars there you participate in this space so when you move inside the building uh, you don't create a separation so segregation so this is the chronotopia so basically we have time plus space working living hand in hand we have worked with specific matters um, materials plasters uh, ceramics concrete minerals so you can see uh, the uh, concrete towards the mountain it is ceramics into the uh, teaching rooms we also have transparencies in the basement and uh, so while i am in the classroom i can enjoy the landscape and i can see the uh, museum so the beautiful you know formula one cars and then you have this kind of you know a, a research center so here we are working in the la ciotat and you can see that the uh, choice of the matter is not just an aesthetic response it means uh, research for example we are now uh, working with the prefabricated panels uh, the value today is totally different than the value it had until some years ago so back to the Lara, uh, it gives you a very um, new idea of light it talks about a strong relationship this is what i said at the very beginning and it's um, exactly your question so building thinking dwelling uh, which is the title you know of uh, of your conference so this is a dialogue it's a look it means believing in one's own convictions and then you may want to have doubts so every time a project helps the following project and once again tomorrow is the yesterday future well thank you thank you so much for this beautiful presentation i have a question for you from paulo Mire, and he asks you uh, well thank you so much uh, for this presentation in your projects uh, the material speaks the language of the project which is the role and the quality of ceramics in your projects well uh, ceramics like many uh, materials is very unique and special because i think that in the past 20 years we forgot a material that belongs uh, to uh, the rest of the world it is not only italian or french or spanish or chinese or south american you know it, it belongs to everyone um you know it's um you know sort of a poor material so it is simple and it is cheap in the past 20 or 30 years because in inverted commas the fault of everyone we use the ceramics also for and only for bathrooms kitchens and uh, you know the uh, floors of shopping malls so um, ceramics is incredible so from the technological point of view today we have so many opportunities it means that we are stating restating messages that giving a very strong message to the ceramics district so they make a huge investments i mean to follow the same uh, projects um you know uh, you have an incredible research um inside the view i mean it's uh you know 3d which is not you know the typical nature of ceramics which is you know uh, sort of um, processed only on the surface but this is an extraordinary material when we offered it for the first time in france well customers uh, didn't know it costs only 42 euros a square meter installed uh, uh, at the end of the work because uh, they thought it was a very very rich and expensive material so this is interesting i mean there's a difference between the perception and the real condition of elements ceramic means um you know restating strengthening a relationship with a local territory and this is why we work with danilo trogo a ceramics artist so he's an artist he's an artisan but at the same time uh, you know he uses industrial techniques there's another question for you uh, which is also for uh, mrs riciotti and mrs mr 
um, Arioldi from a um, student in architecture from Venice. Now, you talked about uh, journeys. So, in your training, in your education as an architect, what is the most important journey? Uh, it is uh, an important, nice question. So as to give information to some future architects, uh, you know, uh, he wants to know what to do and what we have to travel to. Marco, uh, well, first of all, good evening, everyone. Well, um, it's an interesting question, and um, I'd like to say that the most important journey for me was the day where from my city, from my birthplace, Rovereto, and uh, Milan, I went to Bandong. Now, that was my most important journey, or, you know, uh, I left university, and, uh, you know, that was in 2001, even before my degree. And then I have received, uh, you know, a fascinating education from the Polytechnic of Milan, and, uh, you know, I remember I, I wanted to talk about the humanism, modernity, and, uh, you know, I really have a sort of an attraction to modernity or modern things. But, you know, at the same time, I mean, before drawing, before creating plans and projects, uh, I asked so many questions about the same project. So I uh, reached the Bandong at that time that I was no longer able to draw. This is the, the truth. So I was there. And I met uh, uh, Rudy, and uh, well, this has saved me as a professional. I mean, and uh, it has reminded me of the very first article of uh, you know the Constitutional Charter, and I know that Rudy uh, says that the Italian Republic is based on work, on labor. And uh, by working, I managed to survive, to find a place in society. And uh, I can now say something to the world. So uh, at the end of my studies at university, uh, well, this was not the way I felt. Okay, Alfonso. Well, I have traveled a lot. Well, maybe, uh, you know, the journey, I didn't know it was a journey. So when I came to Genoa for my university, so it's uh, less than 50 kilometers, but that was in 1986. So 50 kilometers there uh, was a, a sort of a very different now. So, so for me, it was, you know, like going to London for the first time when you are a student because everything was uh, unexpected, but especially the city. And, uh, you know, when you go far away, as Marco said, when you know what expects you, it's okay. So something that you know already, you may think it's nice, it's okay, you just go. But for me, it was absolutely new and uh, I needed to understand and I couldn't imagine, you know, the uh, consequences of that journey. So uh, I decided, I mean, to come back here and, uh, you know, I decided that this is a place for encounter and exploration. Rudy knows that, well, this is not a chance. I mean, we have spent so much time in Genoa and then he also managed, I mean, to have some parmesan cheese in Genoa. And then he was, uh, he made prophecies and he managed to, uh, to let snow fall in Genoa, which never happens. You know, I, I never thought of Genoa as a journey. You know, maybe it, it was the shortest one, but the most important one at the same time. Mr. Ricciotti, anything to add to this? Uh, now, um, I am interested in one journey only. And it is the journey inside uh, of, uh, of us, inside of me. Uh, you know, and people know that this is something special. So the physical journey, well, this is... Um, you know, something I like is Italy. So Italy is my land. I mean, I'd like to, I may also walk all the way to Italy and then I am no longer interested in all the countries around the world. I mean, Alberto knows, I mean, I've been traveling around the world for many projects and many conferences, but, you know, I think that uh, um, maybe we are at the very end of the myth of journey. So globalization means that we can really touch the rest of the world we have it on the uh, 
tips of our fingers. So uh, once again, uh, it is like a journey in pornography today. You know, we think we know everything. We think we know what is modern. Well, being modern means stopping traveling. And it's a privilege that only the elderly have. So we have to, you know, go out from this kind of uh, big tree with so many branches. I mean, taking you to the sky, to the universe, or to other planets. But I don't like this. This is too far away. So let's cut the trees and let's work on the roots. So what is threatening us is that we are losing our roots. The contemporary uh, philosophy has raped us intellectually. And, uh, you know, some people want us to forget the roots. So I think we need to work on the roots. So once again, we have to have deeper and deeper roots. So we don't have to fly all over the places and then traveling on the different branches, you know, uh, uh, up and down, the right and left. But these branches do not make any fruits. Alfonso, you still travel too much. Oh, no, no. I just, you know, travel between, you know, France and Italy, Italy and France. I mean, it's what? It's less than uh, 100 kilometers. It's what? 60 miles. So, uh, in 2007, instead of going to Paris or to go to, uh, you know, maybe just, you know, it takes one hour from here, you know. Uh, uh, but, you know, I went, uh, well, somewhere else, uh, east, for example, eastbound. But as you said before, you have to feel this inside, you know. Uh, I'm working here around the Mediterranean Sea, and I always feel close to, the, to my home place. I mean, when you drive, I mean, for two or three hours, well, this is not a journey. This is basically just around your city. When you fly somewhere, well, that's different, okay? So I do share this, and, uh, and I agree. And uh, again, you taught me that Italy is an absolutely extraordinary country. It's a small country, and... Uh, um, um, there's not much infrastructure, if you will. So maybe uh, you enjoy driving your car. So it depends on the territories you are crossing. Once again, I mean, choosing the place where you want to start and when you want to come back. I mean, you come back not after 100 years later. I mean, you come back regularly. Uh, and this is why uh, I've been doing this for 15 years. I mean, I, I know uh, I work in Paris and Milan, but I start from Genoa. I come back to Genoa. Because, um, you know, uh, I, I agree with you, Rudy. I mean, uh, being in Genoa is a feeling. It's a sentiment. I mean, I'm not here for, let's say, commercial purposes. Anyway, I don't travel much now. Uh, well, maybe uh, Marco can also answer uh, replacing me because, uh, of course, uh, we need to give you the same opportunity, right? So, Marco uh, Arioldi, maybe uh, with your wife, you may want to travel to a small village, uh, becoming um, a hunter or becoming a fisherman with some white wine or red wine. Come on, Marco. Um, I hope you can really, you know, come back to your family in Milan whenever you want. But please tell us today what you can do uh, for us. So uh, uh, I'd like to visit you. Anyway, I'll be back on the 28th. Okay, Marco, let me take advantage of uh, being here today. And uh, I think we need to uh, try and uh, you know, answer the questions from the audience. I think this is the most important thing. Okay, Marco, let me now give the floor to you. Um, I'm a little bit like Pinocchio, right? Just like, uh, you know, a puppet, okay? I have threats attached, I mean, to the, uh, to the neck, uh, to the arms. So someone is controlling me like a Sicilian puppet. Anyway, Marco, you can continue. And you can also, uh, you know, let's say, uh, talk about this myth. Now, I know my personal philosophy. And I keep saying that we never have to make uh, some confusion between life, life which is worth being lived. I think uh, we have a horizontal line that sometimes we follow. It's okay. It's an architecture that we have and we appreciate. But, you know, in this, uh, you know, uh, job, you really have to be very soft. You have to be happy. You also have to be very physical. So um, you don't have to show the world how, you know, macho you are. 
uh, you have many other opportunities to do so and i think that we can organize the debate around these topics okay the floor goes now to marco well we started i mean talking about this um you know uh with some long phone calls in uh, you know non-office hours so talking about the speed and uh, slowness now eulogy of slowness um we don't have to imagine that you know that's the reality uh, onto which we need to focus right now now for the time being we don't have the time to be slow so of course when you have uh, you know so many projects uh, um, that you have to create uh, in a short time of course you have to learn how to be effective uh, for instance I mean this example may be uh, you know interesting and relevant also for uh, students I know that there are plenty of students I mean Rudy uh, taught me um, not to do you know brainstorming sessions you know lasting 30 minutes where the too many people around the same table uh, you know people may think that okay for well, first of all we are using you know these anglo-saxon words for example brainstorming and that this is flattening you know shrinking the vocabulary that we are using today so we have to work with you know our marketing directors and our people only who are speaking english uh, so so it is a conversation with colleagues it's not a brainstorming and a conversation well requires uh, two persons maybe three persons or three individuals not more than this when we have the possibility to have rudy with us you have to be very quick and you have to really really you know ask the essential key question that you want to ask because uh, you know after a while maybe he has the right answer but only provided that you ask the right question right so you can't imagine you can have a concrete tangible linear answer you know drawing the project you know by doing a draft saying okay this is the way you have to work the answer has to be interpreted by us because of course it is almost never just a, a one-way answer and i can say the same about our architecture this is what i usually say when i uh, you know um, hold conferences and um, you know architecture cannot be interpreted in a binary way i think that today's architecture when it is successful which is the case for many projects for example the cocktail museum i had the possibility to work on that museum in in france well all of this is interesting when they become very let's say well known or widely known and uh, this means that people have the possibility to interpret what they see in many different ways in a multi-rational way so the iconographic research that we do aims at uh, you know touching upon different points you know sometimes we are uh, you know um, mix i iconography with poetry nature and many other sectors and uh, we mix all of these together to create architecture now to reach the shapes that we create these days so apparently you know they hide technologies which are hidden behind if you go to the museum this is an example i mean it's a beautiful project and of course uh, rudy may talk about this but you know architecture there is not boasted I mean, uh, you may think this is low tech at first sight. So once again, going back to English, but um, I'm using the word low tech, you know, in Italian, but it is very sophisticated. Uh, there's, uh, I think, uh, 13 patents uh, that had uh, to be, uh, well, uh, used, well, especially for that contest and uh, thousands of calculation pages just to imagine all the structures so i think there was something like three four maybe five thousand pages of you know uh, uh, of calculations so so if i had to summarize the way we work i would say the following we want to have very clear ideas and then asking the right question at the right time and especially working without chatting too much Thank you, you're right. Uh, it's true, I mean, we don't have to uh, think of too many projects. I think, you know, an architect is a person who makes drawings. You know, um, 
Um, sometimes you may not share this idea, for example, as Alfonso said before, and even, you know, Marco. So if, when you think of the icon, so an icon which is necessary, it gives us the possibility to survive. So if this is true, the research done cannot be found in literature. So we can move from literature to the concrete act of making the, the, uh, the building or turning the architectural project into reality. So once again, the secret is the complexity into complexity. We have to have a sort of you know, cross-sectional um, subjects taken into account. All the secret is hidden in being, let's say, cross-sectional, horizontal, going through many different points. So um, projects uh, don't come by themselves. So uh, sometimes we, uh, you know, we make mistakes in terms of you know uh, um, solitude, or we are too proud of what we say and what we create. So there's a philosopher uh, from the uh, uh, Réunion, that that remote island, uh, talking about being Creole. And um, he says that we are all opaque. So we have to make an effort in order to understand the opacity of the others. I think this is very interesting as a position because, I mean, this takes us far away from many ideas, you know, fluidity, flowing, transparency. So if you want to do something, you know, uh, uh, collective, once again, we have to start from opacity because we all have an opaque math uh, character. So this is the starting point we have to use in order to really understand the character and the attitude of the others. We need to understand the opacities of the other jobs and professions. We need to be interested in the others and the other professions. I mean, why, um, you know, simply um, considering architecture on a seamless way? We need to understand, we need to be witnessing every single masterpiece, understanding, you know, uh, calculation modes. For example, um, at, um, you know, um, well, in my previous presentation, you know, I, I already um, said that, I mean, if you consider a, a station, a museum, I know that there are incredible messages that can be conveyed. I mean, we may, you know, spend hours talking about the concrete or how to create, you know, uh, the so-called joints or how we make, you know, some architectural systems, how to stabilize them, how to fix them, and then joints that are added on a later stage well so how can we create you know one prefabricated part on the one side and then another part on the other and all of this has to work perfectly and seamlessly uh, as a whole so once again we have to fight against opacity so we have to go over the mythology of confusion so the uh, you know um, some very simple basic you know uh, um, exchange of views um, we cannot be so simple so superficial so we have to uh, reject uh, I mean the encounters between different territories what I'm saying is a little violent and dramatic and difficult to understand but I think it's a question of survival uh, otherwise we would fall into total confusion Marco or Alfonso uh, just wanted to uh, add uh, one key point Well, maybe you do not remember, but there's a point that uh, reminds me of what you have just said, um, the relationship with time. So once again, you know, uh, we, uh, we can say that Rudy, I mean, even 10 years earlier, you started, you know, getting closer and closer to Tal and Befeo. So once again, um, this is, I remember that once we, uh, we, we, we were working together and I still remember that action. So um, we were sort of researchers. I mean, uh, uh, we had some engineers from Lafarge, the only person who made some calculations. Now, we have, you know, lived together, thanks to all of your encouragement. I remember the uh, um, Congress Bridge uh, project back in 2000, so 21 years ago. And, uh, you know, the materials we used uh, were really, really very modern, and there were no standards, you know, regulating those materials. You know, uh, you need to be uh, willing, you need to be able to wait, you have to be patient. So maybe you can work for 10 years and um, 
just to really understand the new materials. Uh, you know, some materials may now become architectural materials. And in a way, as Marco said before, this can become, you know, uh, you know um, widely known or uh, very famous. So a circular material. This means the architectural expression in a very generous, frank way. It has taken time to do this, being able to wait, but every single day, working every single day, well, this leads you to the right targets and to the right results. Well, I think that time is the what we have lost. Well, especially the Western societies in the last in the past thirty years. I mean, we have no relationship with time, so we push away ideas like fragility or death. We think we are supermen, superwomen because we don't think of time. We are time, a very small time. So um, we have always had a relationship with time. So. After, you know, 500 slides today, you may think, as Marco said before, that, you know, this is something that you just do. But what Marco said is absolutely true with the 3,000 pages of calculations plus 10 years, 10 years of stubbornness, of research, insights and meetings, encounters with Rudy to explore that material, to turn it into architecture and to, uh, you know, offer it as, uh, you know, a new material. Now, Musen, for example, it's a beautiful act. It's much more than space management or aesthetics. You know, um, 10 years of research done by Rudy. And then, of course, you discover something new every time you talk to him. So this is my personal interpretation. May I add something um, which, you know, echoes exactly what you just said, Alfonso, but also there's a link, a connection with what Rudy said before. I think that uh, what we do has to be based on generosity. Well, in my opinion, for us, generosity is um, something that, 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 that I have learned from Rudy and uh, I now uh, take it for granted, but I shouldn't do this. I mean, the fact of uh, taking risks. And uh, it's something that, I mean, I don't think about this today. I don't even realize. Uh, it is as if I didn't fear anything okay so risks are normal so we live in a society with risks so we are based on fear so if i you know i had to stay what i was before i was you know uh for example uh well a young guy reading a newspaper with some little projects in my little corner well that that's a nice newspaper maybe a sport newspaper right so once again, I don't want to, to, to have any eulogy to Rudy, but it's something that I can see on myself. So we take incredible risks today to be able to work and to, to be architects. And the value of what we manage to do is not the final result. So this is not the architectural projects that then we publish, but rather it is into the relationship that is created among all the players, all the stakeholders, uh, included into the very beginning of the project, I mean the gestation, you know, of the project all the way to the end, maturing, you know, during or throughout the project. I remember extraordinary, unique uh, human experiences. Uh, for example, for the Chanel project, uh, I have the site manager uh, sending me a picture at 6 a.m. in the morning, every morning. And uh, he does the same thing, you know, uh, when the sun goes down. And I, this person is so proud of what he's doing. And uh, we also have the same messages on the Cocteau Museum. Uh, same things. So once again, back to risks. Taking risks. Not being afraid of risks. So, well, this means that companies we work with, they can really keep going. If you give them sort of, you know, prefabricated projects, well, basically they just fall asleep. They have no motivation. Um, huge risks, as, uh, as you said before, you know, the museum has been designed in 2003. I was uh, um, a trainee there and uh, it's been done or made just like it was designed. If, if you look at the Chanel project, basically we have some filaments, you know, in fiber concrete. And it's sort of a miracle we've been able to do this. I mean, thanks to dialogue, thanks to, uh, you know, a risk taking. But all of this is based on an, a, a sort of a, a safety net, which is represented by the intelligence that you have talked about. 
Well, as an architect, I mean, I, I mean, I work in a small province. I mean, I am a reactionary. I am a manierist. I am a small bourgeois with no international, you know, uh, targets. Well, I can say I am a crypto Christian architect. Okay, maybe agnostic Christian, if you will. Anyway. I'd like to say that we need to amplify our creeds, our thoughts. Alfonso talked about materials and even materiality, uh, if you know what I mean, or the uh, you know uh, matter-like aspect. And so this represents, I mean, the physical opacity. So the fact of you know being able to get out of opacity, or maybe we want to retain, we want to store opacity, but then we need to capitalize on it. I think that architects have an incredible power. If you consider politics or economy, maybe we have a sort of a scientific power, right? But so which kind of power do we have? We have a cultural power. We need to understand the secret details of the matter. I don't think it's a matter of consumption. So uh, you cannot make or have a good kitchen a good cuisine just by using the right products. You have to be just like a cook, okay? Uh, you have to assemble, you have to put things together, you have to check the right temperature, and then you have to, to, to choose the right spices. So architecture is this, it's a blend. It's a, it's a complex mix. So I think that young architects, uh, you know, can think that with a minimalist or minimal design, or you know with some very few basic elements you can really you know um, become famous well no way you really have to look for a secret aspect you have to meet people you have to talk to those who really know so that you can really share all of these aspects you may want to go back to the virtues of collaboration so that all together architects and so many other stakeholders we can all share secrets these secrets have to be shared but also kept stored within us maybe we don't have to distribute this or disseminate this to the masses so let me go back to the myth mythology of the 19th century the mythology of the 19th century created a unique facades uh, for example, we needed, you know, uh, three, four different words to describe those facades. Well, um, we need to be able to, uh, you know, use the right words when we describe facades, right? Otherwise, we would, let's say, not be able, we wouldn't be able to do the right thing. Um, it is not the bureaucracy fault. It's our own fault. Uh, the fault is in the hands of the architects. I mean, those who talked about the minimalism, they lost all the words required to describe these, uh, you know, masterpieces. It is not a metaphysical destiny. It is not an intellectual one. I mean, I think, uh, you know, we have participated in crimes. So we've been criminals, you know, sometimes because we have uh, destroyed some memories sometimes. So memories of modernity, this is one of the social diseases, you know, conditions of today. We have to stop using the word modern. I'm not talking about the rationalism because, you know, the word rationalism um, is not translated into the same word. I mean, in French and in Italian, so rationalism is not the right word. But we really have to really need to go back to the secrets of building, the secret of constructing. Because, of course, uh, well, otherwise, entire generations of architects will disappear. Because, you know, companies will no longer need us, I mean, uh, if we continue like this. And, uh, you know, I'm really sorry to say this. I mean, um, we are not great just because we install solar sensors or maybe we study something so technical or technological. We won't survive thanks to this. We need to resist. We need to fight. We need to fight back. I mean, there's a political side that we need to consider. But even before considering, you know, the political aspect, I think we have to consider the romantic, the semantic, the physiological aspects. If we are not romantic enough, we will just disappear. There's a romantic meta, uh, you know, or character in the meta. There's a link linking us to uh, architectural intelligence. Okay, Marco, can you draw the final conclusions? And I need to uh, to have a glass of something. 
or maybe I can, you know, light a candle in the church. You are Bolsheviks, come on. Oh, no, you're right. I mean, uh, Marco is now from Malau. So are you a rationalist, Marco? Anyway. Okay, Elena, what can you tell me? Well, I think that this is my personal conclusion. And the conclusion is that it's time to thank you so much. Although this has been so interesting. We don't have other questions from the audience really would like to thank our guests and I also would like to thank the 490 participants we had today. Once again, 490 um, professionals have taken part in this seminar. I really would like to uh, thank the councillor from uh, Confindustria Ceramica. Thank you so much for your efforts. Uh, you know, Giovanna Gambini. We will meet in Bologna from the 27th of September to the 1st of October. We will continue our reflections with some, you know, Italian tagliatelle uh, in the main square in the city center of Bologna. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Good night.